Hello and welcome to Gem6 CX Impact Podcast. My name is Kalyan Stefanov and I'll be your host for today's episode. It's actually a great pleasure for me to be here with you today as um, this is Gem6 CX Impact's podcast, very first video edition. I recently had the pleasure to visit them and record a podcast with two great people, Tilman Ruzike and Julia Dorr from Roche Diagnostics. We covered a plethora of really, really exciting topics around voice of the customer and how um, the voice of the customer can help organizations in the med tech space, but not only improve their product experience and product innovation roadmaps. I hope you enjoyed this one just as much as I did when I was recording it. And yeah, let's listen to it together. I'm here joined by two wonderful people today for a really nice conversation. And this is Julia Dorr and Tilman Ruzike. My name is Kalyan Stefanov. And maybe you two can briefly introduce yourselves. Julia, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I joined Roche about a year and a half ago. Uh, and uh, I'm a part of the Global Market Insights team. So we work closely with Tillman's team, for example, in terms of monitoring the market, understanding more about customers, uh, about what's, uh, what competitive landscape we're playing in, and really trying to use and leverage those, those insights to build business strategy and uh, solutions that are closer to the customers. Uh, besides that, I've been working with you, Gemsic, for I think the last like 10, 11 years. So throughout my career working in various different healthcare companies and different med tech companies, um, and insights have been a really important part of my toolkit because it just is such an important building block for strategy and for innovation and for solutions building. So I was very happy that one of my first projects was this Voice of the Customer project with Tillman. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you, Julia. And Tillman, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, my name is Tillman Lusiker. I'm in a role that's called International Business Leader. So I'm taking care of the global business for infectious diseases, immunoassays. I'm in this role now for one and a half years, almost two years. And the main yeah, remit of the team, uh, which is me and roughly nine uh, product managers, is to um, create the strategy for the segment, to create the portfolio roadmap for the segment, but also to take care of all the commercialization um, when it's about product launches or also the on-market um, support. Before that, I was um, in multiple roles with Roche, so it's actually more than 10 years that I started at Roche. I was working uh, more than five years in Germany, in the local sales affiliate, whereas I was taking care of um, innovations in the field of molecular diagnostics, so always working with customers, always trying to understand how we can uh, create new markets, how we can bring new technologies, new products to customers. And after that, I was leading a team in the global organization that was responsible for strategy and portfolio management. So also there, um, big strategies and, uh, and thinking about the, the future of portfolio. And also there, um, customer insights were extremely important. Um, this is really interesting. And I'm really personally very excited to be with both of you. And my name is Koyan. I'm one of the managing directors at Gemsuite. Um, it's really a pleasure to talk about uh, the topics that we'll cover today. And maybe we can start directly in the deep waters, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've been doing great work uh, the past months and years at Roche, and uh, as part of that, um, you undertook a very big voice of the customer project. And just wanted to ask you what led you to explore such a project as part of your work, as part of the business objectives, as part of the strategy that you have in the company. So for me, that was one of my my remit exactly was to support Tillman with exactly those kind of things, voice of the customer. Um, so, Tilman, I'm going to leave it to you to talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about where you landed there. But a very important part for me was to make sure that this was an opportunity to get a lot of people involved and engaged and to leverage their experience, right? So I'll be completely honest. I was quite new um, in the company, and I had to work with experts like Tilman as well to talk more about their market. And it was crucial for me to be able to leverage that. So why we landed at the voice of the customer project in terms of the methodology is we could we had a very broad scope in terms of really listening and understanding the challenges that the customers are facing what drives their decisions how do they view innovation how do they view digitalization and what do they expect from us and at the same time we wanted to get very um deep insights as well we wanted to be able to use this to support affiliates to support um, further marketing efforts as well and how Tilman and his team builds the strategy. So qualitative and deep 
um, insight was very important. And that's why we did this voice of the customer while project per se. So I'll leave it at that and then we can pick up a little bit more later. Yeah. Lovely. And Tilman, with you being ultimately the person that's not only <coughs> concerned with the insights, but mm-hmm. the overall business objectives and the strategy, um, how that, uh, how, how did you feel about that going mm-hmm. with the voice of the customer project as part of your overall objectives? Mm-hmm. I think that that's a very good question. And let's, let's put ourselves back in the situation that I was like mm-hmm. almost two years ago. So I was taking responsibility for that segment, which is quite an important segment within Roche. And I looked at the strategy, and to me, it was hard to understand, is it a good strategy? Does it still reflect reality? Will it lead us forward? And I absolutely trusted the team. At the same time, I took over the role almost at the peak of um, the COVID pandemic, Mm -hmm. which you can imagine might have a big impact, mm-hmm. right, on how infectious diseases is testing, mm-hmm. uh, has testing is seen in the market. This was one. On the other side, as for every strategy, there were a lot of assumptions and also insights that went into the past strategy that was built. So what I wanted to understand is how did the market change? Did COVID maybe also change the market for infectious diseases testing? And also all the hypotheses around the market, around customers, around the competition that went into the past strategy, to what extent were these our own thinking and to what was it really reflecting the mind of the customer? Now, there was no voice of customer or no recent voice of customer exercise basically that I could refer to because I think the last was already a couple of years old. And this is then where I partnered or started to partner with Julia and the team. Um, to, to really use the hypothesis that we had and translate them into the market research. Yeah, and that's really interesting because we find ourselves often a company that has deep scientific rules like Roche um, and people start more from the scientific angle. And then by the time everything is already set in stone, that's when uh, they often even skip going with the voice of the customer, understanding what the customer needs are, etc. So I think um, it's a really important um, aspect of how how you go about your work and yeah. maybe maybe i can jump in there because to me it is almost like a like a supernatural sequence of mm-hmm. events and i agree with you also roche is like very scientifically driven at the end what we want to do is we want to bring innovation to to labs to customers to patients and we invest significantly in r d now this is the outcome and from a strategy perspective the innovation, the service, the product, this is like a roadmap you want to see at the end. But that should reflect your your business and your portfolio strategy. And then the question is, where does the strategy come from? I mean, this needs to be derived from insights, from the internal reality, from the external reality. So this was always my, my chain of thinking, to have the insights first, to translate that in the strategy and translate that into the portfolio um, to drive innovation that, of course, are based on, on science at the end. Yeah, But science shouldn't be the starting point. Yeah. One one thing I thought that was really cool again, going back to the experience, and and I know I know you were you know in that role kind of new, but you had a lot of customer experience, right? I think for me, I've been doing market insights for many many years, more than ten years. Your team and you showed up saying we can be completely wrong, we can be completely right. It doesn't matter. We're gonna check, take the polls. And to your point major things were happening in the market as well. I mean, all the challenges around shortage of staff, the testing volumes were changing. Mm-hmm. Everything was about COVID. So we had no idea, you know, equipment change as well with customers. Mm-hmm. They're all of a sudden facing a, a big, a bigger um, load of tests and, and of different nature. So how did they prioritize? How did they think about different things? And how did they evolve, uh, you know, think around the innovation? Because we're mm-hmm. continuously trying to do so. Um, but, but I would say one of my takeaways at the early stage was how curious and open-minded you showed up. Because usually, you said in the beginning, you know, we have our stories, we have a strong gut feeling, and you'll show up with a mindset of, I want to validate my thinking and my hypothesis, but that was not my experience at all. So that, that was mm-hmm. one of the first times in this 10 years of doing market research that I see a very open mindset towards information. I don't know if you were driving that culture, if it's just the mentality of your team or how they work. I think it's a, it's kind of a childish curiosity mm-hmm. that's, uh, combined with a true passion for infectious diseases and the business around this. And it's something that's not true for only me, but for the entire team. And I think this is why they also 
loved the project, why they were so much behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I already had a question written down about what are the factors of success in such projects, but you already took <coughs> the both of you touched upon some of them, and I think I just want to summarize. Mm -hmm. It's about innovation and, of course, scientific thinking, but it's also about open-mindedness and willingness to be wrong and playfulness, seriousness and Absolutely. playfulness, a combination of these to which uh, not every company strikes correctly. And I think it's partly the culture of the company, you know, the culture of the country where the company is based. Mm -hmm. And I think... Uh, Roj being a Swiss company, Switzerland is one of the most innovative countries, and I think that's something which um, clearly can be seen also in the DNA, but also knowing both of you, it's clearly a personal thing as well, so it's not just the company. Um, in terms of the usage of the project, um, could you share a bit more maybe about how the insights are being used um, right now? Of course, without going too much into confidential information, but how they're being used. So... So going, I'm going to backtrace a little bit to your questions of, of uh, factors of success. So first of all, yeah, a great team, very open-minded and like very engaged. We want to take ownership of this and we want to shape it. So let's say I was more driving things forward, but they owned the research. That was, we said that in the beginning, if it's success, if it's a success, it's because of their engagement. If it's not, it's because of me. Mm -hmm. um, but furthermore than that, we also had marketing with us. We had a, a great person that was working with us in this project for marketing, and we had um, portfolio management, we had the project leads. So we have a super representation of anyone who's integrally involved in interacting with customers, we also talk to affiliates, mm -hmm. but also developing the solution. So I think that was super important. So how did the, the um, insights were they used? Well, furthermore, they're still being used today, which is a year later. Uh, but the starting point was they were waiting your team to shape a strategy. And they didn't want to start until they had the customer insights. We knew the market, we knew what the market looked like, but before the customer insights and the voice of the customer was central in the room, the strategic planning, the real big strategy didn't work. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. So and that's, yeah. Yeah. And it, it, I mean, at the end, it's, to me, the voice of the customer is one piece of the puzzle that needs to be in place to understand our context, right? And based on that, to create really good strategy. So I think this was really the first step to use the voice of customer, blend it with all the other information we have on our customers, on the market, also on us, right? Translate it in the strategy. And last but not least, translate that into the portfolio. Because a big part from a global perspective is also the question, what products and services is it that we want to develop in the future, especially if we want to drive innovation? So specifically, the market research helped us to understand what is it that we need to deliver to customers to ensure we are competitive in the market? But on top of that, what is it? What are the areas where we can really differentiate, right? Where we can really um, deliver something that's novel and innovative compared to maybe other vendors. Yeah, absolutely. And one really interesting um, uh, aspect of the usage and the impact of such projects, of course, is that it helps position the product in the product context of the company, the brand reputation, the customer mm -hmm. experience overall. And I think one, and that applies, I think, to all medtech companies in general, not only in the diagnostic mm -hmm. space, but in general, based on our work, we've seen that um, end clients often don't necessarily differentiate, let's say, innovation on the level of the company versus innovation on the level of the product. If on a level of the company, innovation is a, uh, something that clients perceive as Roche, for example, being an involved in a mm -hmm. company, and then oftentimes they also share products that are not necessarily innovative, but more, let's say, commodity as being innovative as well, just by virtue of coming out of Roche. Mm -hmm. Or, um, let's say, you having a very good science scientific team as part of your um, mm -hmm. go-to-market as well when they go and visit lab mm -hmm. uh, decision makers, for example. Um, and how does that square up with, let's say, having a really innovative product, but these additional aspects on the brand level and, let's say, a science team at the market, not necessarily um, delivering this service and also this brand, um, overall brand um, awareness and um, uh, drivers in terms of innovation as well. Is that a, something that you see, a dilemma that you see, uh, and how would you address that? I mean, one of the learnings from this project, from Voice of the Customer, was that innovation is not on the always a shiny new fancy product or new yeah. assay that right now again because of really hard climate 
budget cuts, reimbursement cuts, consolidation of labs, all these things, shortage of of, of staff and, and everything that came amplified the last few years. Innovation is also about making things a lot more effect, effective and efficient, right? So I think that's something that we learned from the customers as well, with the diversity of how they think about innovation. And we asked this openly, we went very deep into it. But I think that was also one way of being humble that it's not mm-hmm. always a tangible tool. It can be a solution to make things more efficient for them to save money, for example. That's just, that came out of this. Mm-hmm. Like, I would absolutely agree and add something more. What I learned from this, from the market research here is that innovation per se doesn't have an intrinsic value for the customer. It might be something that's great for us and something that we want to deliver. But at the end, to me, the point is, what is the need of the customer and how can we address this need, right? And this is then exactly yeah. why, why this market research is so important, that we really understand and put ourselves in the shoes of the customer. And understand, okay, where is it? Where, where do they have issues today? And then something that maybe looks like a very easy solution for us and not very innovative can be perceived as extremely innovative by customers. Because again, for them, it's much more about the perception, how it addresses their need. Yeah. And I think we even had a question on how important is innovation for their decision making. Mm-hmm. And if I remember correctly, it was not very important for them mm-hmm. because their understanding of innovation was very different mm-hmm. to what we think. That is that's such a good point. I'll be honest with you. I would when we asked that question, I was kind of hoping for like the next that the customers would talk about the next generation of mm-hmm. of infectious disease assays and what they see coming on the horizon and and a lot of those visionary and aspirational answers. But you're completely right. They're very pragmatic. It's about their needs. And innovation is something that they enjoy talking to us about. Mm-hmm. And they kind of shift that a little bit to to industry. At the same time, there's a huge opportunity to co-create and listen to what they said. Like you said, innovation for them is about doing their job easy, fast, um, re- reliable as well. Uh, so I think the definition of it, you're right. It, it's not something that if you just say how important is innovation for you when mm-hmm. you choose who to partner with, they won't check the box per se on that definition. It needs to be redefined, perhaps. Exactly. Yeah. Redefined around business impact and in a more broad sense. I really love what you two shared about that and exactly with much better words than I could use in asking the question, really uh, need, um, give a, a, a level of nutritional detail in this dilemma where it's not just about the next level of essay or the next level of product or something like that. It's what's the impact for the client? And is that what really they need? Is that their need? And then they are likely to perceive it as innovative. Um, what are challenges maybe that you've seen um, in doing that work um, that might be applied just to this project, but also to doing um, market uh, intelligence and market insights projects in the diagnostics and net tech space in general? I mean, for me, one challenging part is that most of the time, people like Tillman and, and my different colleagues you know, we want to turn to the market and ask the market, what is, you know, how can we innovate to help new customers? Mm-hmm. What do you need? Really asking that question, like, how can we help you? How can we do this together? And it's very difficult because innovation right now today is a very co-creative space. So there is no clear answer. And it's also difficult sometimes to scale it, to have like one, you know, category of five items that means innovation. Um, so I think that's one part of, that's a challenge in itself. And I think when you ask that question and what we did, what does innovation, innovation mean to you? What do you think about? The answer to that question came from many other things. What's important for you when you're working in your lab? What are the biggest challenges you're facing? Um, so that's difficult, that there's no straight answer. And I think uh, that was a reflection and learning from this project as well. I think that's the main challenge. I, I don't think there were a lot of other challenges, to be honest. Digi- digitalization, it was not really a challenge, but it's one of those fields where it's becoming a solution to a lot of different problems, but it's difficult to define exactly what it is. I mm-hmm. think that's also something where it's a challenge in defining something that doesn't necessarily want to be defined and need to be defined. However, it was something that came up as extremely important to customers. And I understand, to me, It's not a challenge per se to market research. It's more to understand what can be delivered with what kind of method. And I think here we we clearly hit a 
certain boundary in the sense of there's just so much feedback we can get. And for any kind of further, not even insights, but in, in terms of any further, let's say, exploration, this is something that needs to be done together, right? There's nothing we can ask more. Mm -hmm. There's no question we can add on to understand more. It is really something where we need to engage with the customer one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. to explore and co-create, co as you said. Mm -hmm. You're having a really involved customer throughout the process. So not only in the one-way survey format or qualitative uh, research exactly. format, but maybe when it focus group discussion format or product demo format and other aspects. Um, and what are, uh, do you think, the benefits of, in general, throughout the product development <clears throat> and go-to-market lifecycle of having an involved customer throughout, regardless of the method in which the customer is involved versus not having an involved customer? Like for me, customer, um, the voice of the customer is like the battlefield of differentiation and if innovation. Mm -hmm. That's where you get your answers. That's where you get your ability to cater to the market first and best. Um, but I think it's about how you do it. And again, a lot of times, so this example about innovation digitalization mm -hmm. is a perfect example of how you're looking for an answer. And if you don't get it, you kind of resort to doing your own thing. And I think what Tillman's te team did in the end was decide that we heard, we got a lot of answers, we got feedback. What are we going to do with it next? And that's really going on more towards this co-creative field and talking to customers about it and shaping it together versus making the, the strategy in isolation. So I think all companies today have a level of engagement of the customers, some more anecdotal than others, like the uh, sales and relationships that we have and just understanding them in our day-to-day, -day, and others more systemic, like what we do in benchmarking studies, mm -hmm. in MPS, and in what we did with this, which is qualitative studies. Mm -hmm. So we're building on that as well this year as well. We're not doing a structured program, but we're following up on the dialogue in a more open environment, in a more co-creative setting, which is not necessarily market research, mm -hmm. but building something together. And maybe in a few years or next years, we'll shift between going more systemically and doing research, having conversation and dialogue. I would say one is really on the content side to make sure when we set a strategy that the strategy will deliver to customers and will help us basically to drive the business. And to me, it is a little bit like ship or setting the, the direction of a ship, right? Mm -hmm. If you set it just one, two degree in the wrong direction, you won't see it in the short term. Mm -hmm. But in the mid and long term, it will have a big impact. Mm -hmm. And I think here, the voice of customer is really important to make sure the strategy and the portfolio in the long term, it's set in the right direction. Additionally, and you mentioned that already, it is also an element of cultural transformation. So if we want to become more customer centric as a company to make sure we really deliver value and innovation to customers, to patients, we need to understand them. And we also need to have really good examples of market research that people in the organization see, they see the value and they decide, I also do market research. Mm -hmm. I also listen to the customer. So here we have a good example that's picked up by others. And on top, it creates a great reference point. You mentioned my team multiple times. And I see the team is still talking about the outcome of the voice of customer. They're still talking about what customers said, what they wanted, what they don't want. So it also drives to a certain degree the self-organization or the empowerment of my own team because they have a good reference point Yeah, that's coming not from the internal world, but that really comes from the market. Yeah, and I really love your answers. I love your answer, you guys. So I was, <laughs> my next question was going to be like, let's play devil's advocate and convince me why I need to spend money on such a project, but I don't need any more convincing. I'm convinced now. <laughs> and I hope if some of our listeners are wondering whether they should do one or not, um, if of course their organization and their, um, the stage at which they are allows them, I think our recommendation as a group would be a yes, right? <laughs> it would. And I have one more success factor, actually, that I thought of. It is to use this playfulness. We had to start the voice of customer also during the voice of customer exercise. And what I mean with that is we had a lot of experimentation. The way the, the, the interview guide looked at the beginning was not how it was looking in the end. So mm -hmm. we did a couple of experiment interviews. We said, okay, um, does this feedback help us? Doesn't help us? Help, does it help to drive decision? Do we need to pivot anywhere? And then it was really kind of an iterative process, right? To do all the interviews, to get the insights, and then also to understand, is there something where we have blind spots, like the digital space, mm -hmm. where we then said, okay, let's have some 
deep dive sessions just on that one topic. So also that I think was a big success factor actually to keep that flexibility. It, it sure was. And I think one thing to remember, it, it was a heavy, I mean, it was a lift by everyone. Mm. Like it required a lot of engagement. Work. We were clear on that on the beginning is that, and I've done so many market research projects. <laughs> I mean, a million. And uh, the problem is that when there's no engagement of the people that will actually use the insights to do something with it, it just falls to the ground, right? It doesn't have any traction. Um, and I think that was the big thing. Everyone was engaged. People would, sh would show up on a weekly basis, even for a check-in, to challenge the questions, to ask questions, to go out and reflect and come back. So for me, a success factor in, in terms of how you invested the money, the cost is a monetary value, but we all spend a lot of time on it. Absolutely. It was a very joint effort of we're going to do this together. Um, absolutely. I think that's an important learning because otherwise it won't, won't be the same. If we would have gone away for three months, done the research and come back and then a workshop, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. So adding engagement to the success factors, definitely. I've seen, unfortunately, the second type of projects where little or no engagement and they, they do tend to fall to the ground. So like an airplane, maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I really love the ship metaphor, especially in, in industries which are really um, long, long term views, because in your industry, long term client relationships matter. Absolutely. So it's not about selling something today and then moving to the next customer. It's about multi year client engagements, long term client success. And this couple of degrees of deviation that you described, I think this is really, really uh, important and a key um, aspect of why. Capturing it really well with a high level of engagement is um, important. Is there anything else you would like to share that you believe might be interesting for our listeners? I think what would be interesting to share maybe also surprises. So what, what was your surprise moment or your surprise insight? Oh my goodness. Uh, I was humbled a few times during this research. I think one thing that was really important for me was, um, again, like on that digitization part, we first thought we were doing methodological, like errors in the method. Like we we're asking the question wrong when we're asking people about digitization. What does it mean? What do you expect? And we just kept on going back to like picking on how we did it. How? What can we ask differently? What can we do? And like Tillman alluded to, we even went back and did more interviews. And then finally, this learning of we just need to view the topic differently. We need to think about it differently. How does the customer think about digitization? Digitalization. They think it's very important but it's not um, completely defined. That's a learning in itself. And that was one big surprise for me as well, to learn that there might not be something concrete to learn. And then what else? For me, one, that's a personal thing for me. Mm -hmm. I think it was one of the few times that I have been able to be so strategic as a role mm -hmm. of an insights partner, mm -hmm. because I was actually able to sit there and, you know, um, co-create and be a part of the project work and even when they did the strategy workshop which is what you want right yeah. that's the ultimate dilemma probably for you as well at GEMSEEK to deliver insights and this is decision support but not sit at the table when they're discussing mm -hmm. discussing it that's not sometimes that's very mm -hmm. frustrating mm -hmm. so I love that that was <laughs> super great for me another surprise was you know this was the first time we worked together with the business international business team the insights team also the marketing team and the affiliates to see our role, you know, like in the vehicle, mm -hmm. sometimes I was driving, other times the business team, then marketing, then the affiliates, and just have engagement throughout the whole process, but trust the process as well that your moment will come in when you need to step up and work um, on your part. So that's more a learning than a surprise. But yeah, yeah. what about you, Tilda? I think my biggest surprise or learning was on how customers actually or, or let decision makers build their opinion. Mm -hmm. And what I mean with that is, I mean, it's it's an investment business. They're investing in equipment. It's, uh, as you say, it's multi-years contract at the end. So as I'm also quite rational myself, I would expect them to take a fully rational decision. Now, what was interesting when we asked them how they build their opinion, what they think the market leader is, they, they refer to their colleagues. Oh, my colleague is saying this company is the market leader, so it must be a good, uh, must be a good company. Yeah? So I think this was very, very interesting. Whereas we internally think the one company that has the highest market share is really perceived as the market leader also by customers. I think here the voice of customer really made the proof this is not the case. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you can have a very, very strong brand 
and perceived as a leader, even if, let's say, formally, you don't have the highest market share. And I think this is quite interesting. Yeah. And humbling a way, in a way Absolutely. as well. And a very valuable lesson. I also think that one of the learnings for me was also that customers, when you ask them, what do you think is important for you in your purchase journey and your partnership, choosing a partner? They will not say the answer is top of mind. So you kind of have to dissect it. Like, how do you go about things? Like you said, mm -hmm. the first step, talk to your peers. Uh, one of the interesting things that I learned was also that uh, customers didn't necessarily say service is really important to us, mm -hmm. but they would say that it's incredibly impactful for them that when service is not working, mm -hmm. when service is a problem. And I think that's something as well where, again, you go into how do you actually interpret the insights and the information and the answers you get and how you ask them. It's a much more um, nuanced way than just taking question A, answer A equals, you know, yeah. X, Y, Z. Yeah, the action and the strategy. Yeah. In the end, ultimately, we're all humans, and that applies really to high-level decision makers mm -hmm. in the lab diagnostic space as well. Even though they are really well-educated, experienced people, sometimes they take decisions based on emotion, on word of mouth, Absolutely. and other aspects as well. And that's something that we as professionals, we have to take into account when we do the project innovation roadmap, product portfolio, and all other aspects. Great. I think this was a really lovely conversation. I personally really enjoyed it. Um, is there something else that you would like to add? Yeah, you were saying, that's interesting to me as well, right? We talk about patient first at Bosch, that's really our operating principles is all around putting patient first and patient outcomes. And then we focus on the labs and everything. So how does that fit together? I would say it fits perfectly together. Now, I mean, first of all, we need to understand from a medical perspective, what are unmet uh, medical needs? And this is something we can explore together with our medical experts and also together with clinicians in the market. Now, what we need to understand is the lab at the end is the the organization or the stakeholder that provides the services to the clinicians to provide value to the patients. So from that perspective, we really need to understand the perspective of the lab and how to set them up to, for success to deliver this value for clinicians. I hope you enjoyed this really interesting conversation on gem 6 x Impact podcast. Many thanks once again to our guests, Tilman Ruzike and Julia Dorr from Roche Diagnostics. Stay tuned for more of Gem6 CX Impact podcast, both in the new video format as well as the regular audio format. Thank you.